Hi guys, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at stripping an Orient 46941 calibre movement and this is a vintage Orient watch, it has got quite a few scuffs and scrapes on its very 70s case and crystal as you can see but it's still a very nice watch so we'll begin by removing the case back which is a screw on back followed by the rubber sealing ring and the movement holder ring and the sealing ring holds that movement ring in there quite stiff once it's bedded into place so a little bit of wiggling is needed here but once the gasket is removed the movement holder ring lifts away as you can see next to be removed is the oscillating weight I always do this on automatic movements before I uncase them and then the stem is removed from the case in this case by pulling out to the hand setting position whereupon the setting lever becomes visible and you can depress that with your tweezers and draw it away Here I'm using a Presto hand removal tool to remove the hands. The thing that's quite good with the Presto tools is it allows you to remove each hand individually um, rather than all at once. You can still remove them all at once if you wish to do so. Um, I do like hand levers but the Presto tool does come in handy. Next step is to undo the dial feet screws which are eccentric screws located on the back so they just need a half turn to prevent to stop them gripping the dial feet and then the dial with a little bit of gentle levering with the screwdriver just lifts off and the dial is then put into a protective case just to keep that safe from damage. After removing the dial spacer ring we go ahead and remove the retaining clip for the day wheel which um, for those of you who've worked on Seiko will see many similarities from this point on um, as they are very very similar movements so the C clip lifts away and as you saw it popped off there uh, quite often you, you'll need to just wiggle that free with your tweezers but uh, it just popped off there and there's the day wheel with the star on the back that moves it around and there I'm showing the actuation of the rapid day advance button Here I'm removing the automatic bridge which consists of a bridge, the magic levers, pole levers very much like the Seiko ones that you will have seen and be familiar with and the second reduction wheel. As you can see there the principle of operation is exactly the same as any Seiko movement you will have worked on and quite similar to uh, the 6309 series where the magic levers the pole levers are actually underneath the bridge rather than exposed on the top and that just shows the position of the second reduction wheel next to the ratchet wheel Next to be removed is the balance cock and balance complete. And this is before I turn the movement over and continue on the dial side just for safety to, um, to prevent the delicate pivots and hairspring from being damaged. wiggling the lower pivot out there 
I like to remove it this way rather than lift the whole thing up and have it tug out by the balance spring. And here I'm just letting down the spring power. On these watches, as with the Seiko movements that are not manual wind, uh, this has to be done with a screwdriver on the barrel or the screw because it doesn't have a manual winding facility so you cannot use the, uh, the crown to let the power down. And here I'm removing the day wheel jumper spring which is held in by two small screws. This needs to be wiggled free of the post over to the right of the picture there, You'll see, um, next to the second screw hole, which you'll see as it pops off eventually. There we go. And then the plastic date advance finger is removed by first removing the retaining screw and then the only, thankfully, plastic part of this movement. Uh, this is something I'm, I'm not overly keen on with newer Seikos and with some of the Orients are the use of plastic parts, especially with the newer Seikos and their use of plastic gears. It's, uh, it's quite a frustrating thing, it's not something I like to see, but it is what it is. And uh, underneath that there's a metal ring as well. We'll remove that at the same time, although that could have been left in place while we take away the cover plate. And next we remove the two screws at the top that hold the cover plate in place. This in turn holds down the jumper spring for the date ring and the date ring itself. It's always recommended to lift these away very very carefully and check the underside of them as you see here because often in movements that have been over lubricated you will find that things like um, uh, intermediate wheels and such like can, can tend to stick to the underside of the plates. As you can see the date ring just lifts away and then the date ring jumper spring which sits at the bottom of the plate lifts off of its pivot there. There's the intermediate wheel for the date advance which is driven from the hour wheel. and then the date advance wheel itself. Here I'm removing the rapid day advance pusher which is retained by a screw and is a single piece of metal with a slot in which is actuated by the spring loaded pusher that you see on the lower left of your screen there and that's followed by the minute wheel and then the clutch there is no um, winding pinion on this movement because like the Seiko's it is uh, automatic wind only and here I'm popping off the cannon pinion you can get specialised cannon pinion removers, I don't have one myself so I tend to use uh, tweezers for that task. And down there I'm just removing the cover plate for the setting lever. Followed by the setting lever itself. and then the yoke which has its own built-in spring. 
And this is a nice feature of uh, these watches and Seiko's. They they tend to have they tend to be built as a complete component so that you're not fiddling about with shepherd's crook springs and the like although it is handy to know how to manipulate uh, the smaller click springs and shepherd's crook springs and such like there is in fact one underneath the pusher for the rapid day advance that you can see there and then we move back onto the top of the movement and remove the barrel arbor screw, the thick washer and then the ratchet uh, wheel. The, um, quite often, especially with Seiko, you will find that the barrel arbor screw and the washer are a complete unit. In this, this case you can see that they are separate. There are then three screws which hold the barrel and train bridge in place these are removed and then the bridge is lifted away carefully on top of this bridge are two diafix jewels that you can see they are a pain and here is the combined click and click spring for the ratchet wheel again just like the Seiko's we've got the fourth wheel The third wheel, and the mainspring barrel, and here I remove the pallet fork bridge. Ideally, I should have done this prior to removing the train and barrel bridge. However, it's uh, as long as you don't try and, um, and force anything out, it shouldn't be a problem. And you'll notice that when I lift away the pallet fork bridge, the pallet fork remains stuck in the bridge. This is typically a bad sign because it usually means that the pallet fork pivots have been oiled, which is generally speaking not a good thing. It's not recommended. On, um, on pallet forks to oil the pivots. And then we're removing the escape wheel now that we have access. And finally the center wheel bridge and center wheel. balance is then refitted with the jewels intact give it a little shake to make sure that the pivots are located before screwing that down and then the whole assembly and the rest of the components are put through the cleaning machine Uh, here I'm removing the mainspring from the barrel and just demonstrating here with these types of barrels, same as the Seiko, you have got a very, very thin slot where the barrel cap um, presses over the edge. These were never designed to be serviceable and um, they can be very, very fiddly to take the cap off, quite often pressing as, uh, as normal does not work so I use a sharp knife as you can see there levering gently working my way around until the cap comes away here I'm oiling the um, balance pivot jewels um, the end stones and uh, 
using the manual oil method, as you can see there. And here is a, this is a cocktail stick or toothpick or how, whatever you'd like to call them. And the end with the black mark on has been shaved down to a smaller size, which tends to be useful for Russian calibers, which have a tri-star um, shock jewel. And the wider end that I'm using there is used to remove and refit dia shock, the triple point type dia shock shock springs, which tends to work better, I find, than fiddling with a couple of pairs of tweezers. Now we go onto the reassembly after cleaning manually and oiling the, um, the balance jewels. And we begin with the center wheel oiling the pivots and then the center wheel bridge. Hopefully this angle is better than previous ones. I have actually found an old camcorder um, so the, the quality might not be quite as good, but it's small enough that I can fit it on the bench in front of me, so uh, therefore seeing a bit more than usual. So as you can see there, the completed, um, the cleaned and refitted mainspring and barrel are put in place, and then the third wheel and fourth wheel lubricating the spindle of the fourth wheel and this is checked for free running we then fit the escape wheel and prior to refitting the barrel bridge the two diafix settings which i haven't shown um, removal and cleaning and refitting of because they're very very fiddly and hard to film they are oiled using a version 1A automatic oiler. They are an utter, utter pain to try and oil manually and refit back into place. They're, they're easy to oil, they're just nigh on impossible to fit back into place without knocking them out of place. Um, they're horrible things. I, I, don't, I don't know a single person who, who um, thinks that they are particularly good in any way, shape or form. They're awful things, but the 1A automatic oiler really does a great job of oiling these while they are locked in place, making sure that oil doesn't go where it shouldn't. So then the barrel bridge is refitted, or barrel and train bridge complete is refitted, and as you can see, the barrel is manipulated just to make sure that the whole train is spinning as it should. The screws are nipped down and then it's checked once more just to make sure everything's turning freely before they're tightened and then oil is applied to the barrel arbor and to the center wheel pivot. The ratchet wheel, washer and barrel arbor screw are then refitted. And that's tightened by holding the ratchet wheel in place with a pair of tweezers while nipping that up. Next we fit the pallet fork and pallet fork bridge. And also not shown because again it's it's very very it's fiddly to do, let alone fiddly to try and show on film is the oiling of the um, of the exit pallet stone because you have to get in really close with a loop using the smallest oiler that you have and a tiny tiny drop of oil which you place on the on the face of the exit pallet stone before uh, adding a couple of wines and manipulating the pallet fork um, to distribute that around the escape wheel it's it's very very hard to to actually see and do let alone to film so hence the reason that's not demonstrated. There are some videos around on YouTube where people try to demonstrate the procedure 
uh, whilst filming it under a microscope, which is not something I have, and th that will give you an idea of what you need to do. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's quite difficult. Here I'm adding one wind. I always like to, before I refit the balance, I always like to add just a single wind because this is a good pointer of how well the balance oscillates with just one wind of the mainspring. And if you get a good beat initially, like here with about 180 degrees of beat of uh, swing of the balance wheel, then you know that you've got a good free running train and everything is well with the barrel, the train and the escapement. Of course, prior to regulating at the end of the rebuild, the mainspring would be wound fully. So we'll move on to the dial side and Oiling the centre pivot, we refit the cannon pinion. And then oiling the posts and adding a little bit of grease on the contact points we go ahead and fit the yoke and the setting lever. There I'm using a little bit of Brodico just to clean up a dot of oil where I caught the side of the plate with the oiler. Using, using a bit of pegwood there while I manipulate the yoke into place so that the setting lever clicks down into the recess and then adding a little bit of grease to the contact points where the setting lever moves up and down. And then once the plate securing the setting lever is fitted into position and screwed in place this can be manipulated back and forth a few times just to check it and here again I'm adding a little bit of grease on the contact point. As these points would rub together during operation. And there you can see how the setting lever and yoke interact. Next I'm refitting the Rapid Day Advance pusher and the Shepherd's Crook spring is fitted into place. This is not one that has to be fitted under tension um, initially because once the pusher is secured in with a screw it's, it will actually pull the spring into place itself. Hopefully you understand what I meant by that. And here I'm just completing the lubrication of the train jewels on the dial side. Remembering of course that the pivot jewels, uh, the pivot, uh, sorry, the pallet fork pivots are not oiled. Again adding grease to the contact points and the points of rotation I fit the next portion of the rapid day advance mechanism and then the minute wheel. This should have been fitted the other way around but it is possible to, to wiggle that minute wheel in without actually twisting or bending anything. But ideally I should have fitted that minute wheel first before the second part of the rapid day advance mechanism went on. I then refit the clutch. And then the date advance wheel and intermediate wheel. The intermediate metal plate.
the date wheel jumper spring again lubricating the pivot point and contact points of the spring It's very easy with the grease particularly to uh, to get that in places where you don't particularly want it. So keep a bit of pegwood and rodico handy for cleaning up if you happen to touch areas where you get grease where it's not wanted because you don't want that to spread around the movement. So here I'm fitting the hour wheel. and the date ring which is placed into position which holds the date wheel uh, jumper spring slightly under tension so that's held in position while the cover plate is placed and the two securing screws are fitted to make sure that it doesn't jump out Next to be fitted is the plastic finger of the date advance wheel, making sure that one of the two flat sides is aligned with the pin of the metal wheel and then this is screwed into place. This has to be fitted after the plate because it sits above it. then locate the day wheel jumper spring and secure that with its two screws followed by the day wheel itself if you manipulate this around so that one of the two larger holes gives you access to the jumper and you can just move that gently out of the way with your tweezer tips to make sure it locks down at which point you can refit the c-clip and just here i'm just running through a wind to make sure that the day and date both advance correctly as they should next to be fitted is the the dial ring which I have actually got fitted upside down at this point and realizing this later I switch that around as you can see here and it, uh, it has to be fitted this way up or it will not sit in the case correctly and the rapid date advance pusher will not clear the ring so that needs to be fitted with the flat side um, uppermost as you're looking down at the movement in the case and we then refit the hour minute and seconds hand unfortunately on refitting the seconds hand I fitted that on and uh, wasn't happy when I did a test of the thing so uh, once I'd, uh, I'd cased it and turned it around to check as you can see there I'm just pointing out the the spacer and the correct fitting um, so on removing the seconds hand to reposition everything and then uh, possibly due to metal fatigue as I removed the seconds hand it actually broke away the tip of the uh, fourth wheel uh, the seconds wheel so um, it currently has no seconds hand because the tip of that is remaining in the seconds hand which I cannot fit obviously so I will be looking out for another movement to replace that and replace the seconds hand at some point but the rest of it works fine. So here I'm uh, replacing the automatic bridge. I didn't actually show the stripping of the automatic bridge but there are just two plates that hold the pole levers in position and the reduction wheel and it's just simply a case of 
uh, making sure they're in the correct position and oiling the jewels for those and there I'm just making sure the oscillating weight is located before that's screwed on and then with the case back on and of course with the movement ring and the um, the ceiling washer here we see preliminary uh, timings which are in um, dial down, pendant down, pendant right and dial up positions and are um, the, these are just preliminary timings which I will adjust accordingly. So I hope you've enjoyed this and thank you for watching.